to some syntax issues. All right, present. All right, so the last lecture topic I want to talk to you about, there's only, like I did last week, I felt like last week was better with fewer slides. So I did it again this week. Uh, we're going to talk about methods, all right? Um, and a method, also called a function, is a very easy to understand concept. But it's one of those ones where we're going to have to code a little bit to sort of understand um, um, how to use them. And, and I'm also going to be pushing heavily on you today with some coding. So if you want to go ahead and open up repel.it, create a new repel. I, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I, I like to think it's repel. Uh, go ahead and create a new Python repel. We will be doing that in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to be pushing on you to kind of use some Google to solve this because you've, you've at this point seen, oddly enough, all there is to imperative programming. There, you've gotten variables, you've gotten if statements, you've gotten while loops, and methods kind of rounds it out. There's really nothing else that 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 is imperative to imperative languages. This uh, and by imperative language, I mean uh, step one do this, step two do this, step three do this. There are languages that don't follow that, but but they're crazy. All right. So anyway, uh, so let's talk about methods. What is a method? Okay, so. A method, also called a function. I'm sorry, that got super tiny. Let me make that big. Um, a method, also called a function, is, is really an easier concept than it makes it out. But we do need to say this. Methods or functions are pieces of like pre-built code. And the only thing that you really know need to know about it is what goes in and what's go out, what goes out of the code. The technical word for what goes into a function or what goes into a method is called an argument. The technical word for what comes out is called the return or the return value. But I hate teaching it the technical way. I prefer to teach it by analogy. Who here has ever made sushi? Anybody? And my favorite follow-up question is, oh, wait, Elena, you made sushi? Yes. Did you make it well? No. There we go. <laughs> I love it. All right, so absolutely. Sushi is one of those things that I like to say I don't like to spend money on stuff that I can't do myself. So I spend money on sushi, right? Because it's, it's an incredibly difficult process to get right. The rice has to be just perfect. The, the ingredients have to be fresh and, and it tastes, and by the time you get, just go to, you know, the place on the corner and get you a, a crunch roll. And we all understand and accept the process of ordering sushi. So, so Katie, you do, you, do you eat sushi? I haven't in a while. All right. What's your favorite sushi roll? Um, oh, I can't remember. Oh, okay, sorry. Does anybody else have a favorite sushi roll? Nemo roll. Sushi is my favorite food. So, oh, what is it? Nemo. Nemo I roll. Fish. Yeah. All right. So awesome. Okay. So a Nemo roll. Whenever you walk into a restaurant, that's kind of a predefined package, right? But if if Zach, if you were to build this out, and you were try to order it in another way, we had to check little boxes for what should go into it. Your first question would be, is it gonna be Maki where you roll it up or is it a hand roll where it looks like an ice cream cone, right? And you select, oh, I want it to be Maki because Nemo rolls are Maki, right? And then what are some other things that you would check to go into your Nemo roll? Make sure that there is salmon in it, roll cucumber, salmon. avocado, rice, um, and seaweed. Awesome. And even then, you understand that you can have some variation and it still be a Nemo roll because yeah. I don't like seaweed. I don't like the nori. So I want soy paper to be my wrap, right? Mm -hmm. So you can customize it by hitting these check boxes. Now, inside of a sushi restaurant, you can see behind the glass, but that doesn't mean that you know how to do it, right? So you write out the check boxes and you have an expectation about what comes back. I'm going to give one more analogy to this, all right? So there's a few people in this room that know my father, all right? Now, my father is an exceptionally hardworking man, and I am not, 
Like I am, I am with the computer science stuff, but around the yard, I'm not. But there's something about my dad that he can't do. Okay. And why I'm still valuable to my father, right? Is that whenever he goes to get on the tractor and he cranks it and it doesn't go, he's done. He is finished. He doesn't know anything about that tractor past the key, right? He cranks it. It doesn't go day over. Is this a problem? Is it a problem? Only if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. <laughs> Only if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And if it's a good tractor, it's going to Yeah, run. for him, it's a problem. Yeah, for him, it can be a problem if it's broken. Absolutely. But let, I'll put it this way. Besides those exceptional cases, how many of you know the exact internal workings of a combustion engine? I don't but you drove to work, right? And that's what's most important. So this, this is called abstraction, right? This whole concept is called abstraction. So long as you know the controls and how to operate it, you don't need to know the overcomplicated inner workings of that car, right? That makes sense, right? I don't know how to work on my new car. Yeah. I mean, I know how to work on a Chevy, but I don't know how to work on a new car, right? So. We, we get that idea that there's abstraction and it takes all the complexity and it hides it away from us. Inside of computer science, we call this abstraction or the black box. OK, and it's not like the little black box or whatever, whatever it is in the airplane. Right. It's not that. OK, instead, it just it's something that we go, give me what I want and it gives it to me back. All right. All we care about is the input and the output. I'm going to give you a computer science example of why this is very important. And I'm going to ask you the easiest question I've ever asked. Give me a number between one and 10. Five. Five. That was a horrible guess. Gosh, I can't believe. Leave. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, uh, yeah. So now what's funny is, is, is Zach in his guess actually did something that was quite incredible. All right. Now, if we're to believe, that we can be random. Zach just pulled a number at random from his head and it didn't struggle. It's something that I could easily do with any of you. I could walk up and go heads or tails and you see a coin and you're going to go heads or you're going to go tails, right? And it may be at least seemingly random. But here's one of the craziest things. A computer is completely incapable of doing this. They can't. They cannot give you a random number. So what can they do? Well, they can give you a kind of random number. So I'm going to show you the, the uh, a, a source code here. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it up. And let me see if I can share this. I wish there was a quicker way to just share a different tab. This is the random number code, just to get a random number between one through 10 in Java. All right, now, yeah, there's a lot of comments here. Wow, okay, I'm, I'm good at Java, but I have no idea what this does. Well, that's a comment, so it's like this one, right? I don't know what that one does. All right. Wow. Okay. Remember, getting a random number between one and 10, we're not here yet. We're not here yet. 1,227 lines of code to get a random number between one through 10, which let me tell you, isn't even random. It isn't even random. It's made to look random, but you can still guess it. That is wild to me. Absolutely wild. That, that computers can't handle such a simple thing. So I have a question for you. What if your final project in this class was to create a random number generator? How many of you would be excited about writing 1,200 lines of Python to give you a random number between 1 and 10? I don't think anybody would. But this is the beauty of functions. Those 1,200 lines of code is the internal combustion engine. It's my dad's tractor motor. Okay, 
it doesn't matter what's in that file. It doesn't matter if you understand it. I have a PhD in this stuff and I don't even come close. I don't want to understand it. All right. I don't. But that's okay. All that stuff is abstracted away by something called a function. And all we need to know by function is what goes in and what comes out. So I'm about to share a line of code that will literally get the same result as that 1,200 lines of code. Here we go. This is going to blow your mind. It's so intricate and long and, and smart and all this stuff. Wait, is this the right one? That can't be it. It is. It is. This is a random number generator. Okay, you see this little line right here, random dot rand int zero through nine. When I hit run, it gives me two. Three, zero, nine, four, two, eight, eight, zero, six. That's it. See, all of that complexity goes down to just a little snippet of code. To read this in our English ish ish ish, okay? Our first line, import random. I'm going to tell you what that is in a very short way because in the long run, it doesn't matter. That imports something called a module or a library, which is a big section of, of, of other people's code. And in this case, it's the 1,200 lines, right? And so it kind of copies it where it says import random at the top. And then line two is just a space. But line three says print random.randint, which we can kind of figure out. That's like a random integer between zero and nine. And that's it. To understand it from that side is fairly straightforward. So type this into repel.it and change it to print out a number between 1 and 100. And remember, the details matter. That's 0, 0,9 and not dot .9. All right, who's got it? Who's got a random number between 1 and 100? Got awesome. It. Carter got it. Swastika got it. Awesome. Swastika, what did you change? Um, just, I, I just did 0, 0,99. 0, 0,99. Awesome. And I think, I don't know what this will do. 0 through 99 will give us that. Let's see. So, now, it'll give us as a chance 0 and 99. I don't know if this will work. Will 1 to 100 work? All right, we could also do 1 to 100 if we want to just get straight up 1, one through 100. So awesome. Swasti, you got it 100%. We expected to get a number between you know, 0 and 99, so we changed what we put into it. Everything else goes out of it. How do y'all feel about that? Are there any questions? I have one question. Hit me. So if we were going to import like a different type of method, um, like how do you know to how much you need to abbreviate the method by? Like, is it like every like four letters? Like I know you put like rand int or is it just various? You'll have to Google it. That is, that is a great question. You will have to go through a reference for this to okay. see what those functions are. And we're actually going to do a little bit of that uh, in, in, just, in just a little bit. So, so, so like to get all of these different methods, would I just look up like Python method sheet and there'd be we're, like... We're totally just about to do that. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no, it's great. 
So your next challenge is, okay, we're going to take all the stuff of me showing you this stuff off. And I want you to right now, because you've got loads of browser tabs and most of you have wide windows or not windows, monitors, things. And I want you to change it. Give me a random floating point number between zero and pi. Zero and pi, which is 3.14159 for all intents and purposes. You know, I was like 30 years old before I found out it wasn't intensive purposes. I really thought it was that thought it was intensive purposes, not purposes, intensive purposes. I didn't know it was intense and purposes. A random floating point number between zero and pi. Let me know if you figure it out. I will tell y'all what I did to solve this problem. And remember that I have a PhD in computer science. I got it, but I think it's, I don't know. So <laughs> <clears throat> I can what tell I, you what I did if you want. Oh, absolutely. Can you paste it in the chat? Yes. So I Googled Python random floating point number. <laughs> That's what I did. And I clicked the first link. And instead of random.randint, I see one that says returns a random float number between a range. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste it here. And then I'm just going to do 3.14159, which is good enough for government work. And I work for the government. All right. And that's going to be it. That's kind of my answer. I'm going to give you a second to, to catch up with that. Oh, that was perfect. Yeah, that is exactly what Zach did. Good, good, good. Zach, did you even find the same page I did? Unfortunately not, no. We were just probably like one link off. Oh, God. This is this is actually how most of computer science is going to work moving forward. You're going to get something like, okay, I need this. And you're going to kind of Google around, find some documentation. I said it earlier that we have these cheat sheets. And I'm about to use a cheat sheet right now because I don't remember something that's going to be in the second part of this. They give us like lots of little looks into it. Um, but we actually go through and we Google things. We look for documentation. We figure them out because each of you has drastically different application areas for computer science, whether or not it's the world of publishing, mechanical engineering, Business, analytics, supply chain, database management, that sort of thing. We have to be able to look for knowledge inside of that domain. And actually, that kind of does mean Googling stuff. And we we kind of get a criticism in computer science that sometimes people are like, a, a degree in computer science is, is kind of like a... Uh, 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 
a degree in Google. Yes, it is. I would argue all degrees are kind of like a little bit of a degree of Google, okay? Uh, awesome. Let me see this. Outstanding. Swastika actually used another library or another module. I'm sorry, in Python they're called modules, where she uses import math and uses math.py to get a lot longer than 3.14159, which is why me and Zach are going to go work for the government. Zach, the pensions are amazing. They're just great. 25 years, full pay, buddy. All right. So, all right. So I'm going to give you another challenge. All right. If you can get caught up with this, I'm going to give you one more challenge. Give me the sign of a random number between zero and pi. Let me say that one more time. Give me the sign, and we're not talking like Aquarius and Sagittarius and all that stuff, whatever. All right, so we're talking about the sign, trigonometric sign of a random number between zero and 3.14159. You can do this. And I know that I'm asking you to Google on a Monday night how to do what I'm supposed to be teaching you. But I promise this is really what we do. Google around. She seems to be. All right. Has anybody been able to figure it out? All right. I'm going to... Okay, so I'm looking through and you know, sure I'm unmuted. How am I solving this? Uh, so I'm going through and Googling this. Uh, it says W3 schools. Uh, actually, I know that site. It's kind of common. But uh, this one appeals to me more. Geeksforgeeks.org. That's my people trying to talk to me. So I'm going to see what's going on with that all right so i come down and i scroll it looks like a mobile site Blah. all right code one looky there 
there's some crazy stuff going on. I don't even know what in code what in the world. But I see one thing. Math dot sign of A. Oh, whoa, that's a lot of stuff. I like the first one. Code one. That's what I think. So this says import math. A equals math dot pi. And I don't understand this print statement with what I've taught in this class. So I don't think we got it. Okay, let's let's just copy this. Let's just copy this. And I'm just going to hit control V here. All right. I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying. I got a red squiggly line, which means I've got an error in my syntax. I've got an error in my syntax. Now, to solve this, I'm going to look at what it says when I, when I highlight over it. It says undefined name math. Well, that seems like a great thing. All of a sudden, we have forgotten all of math. We don't know what math even is. How do we solve this? Well, I go back and I look at what we had here. And it said importing math for mathematical operations. So I think we needed this line too, this import math. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go over to this tab, and I'm going to see what... All right, so now I've got random numbers, and I've got math, the two most important things to this code, right? Well, I still got a red squiggly line, but you notice what happened to this one? That red squiggly line over math went away. We fixed that one. So let's see. It says undefined named A. Okay, so that's like a variable. So I want to change this piece of code. What I want to do is I want it to print out a random number between zero and pi. And then I want to print out something A. That looks like a variable, doesn't it? So what about this? What if we made this instead of printing it, we, we set that equal to a variable like this? Let's see if it runs. Zero point three, zero point six, zero point nine, zero point two, zero point six, point five, zero point seven, zero point one. Okay, so trigonometric functions like sine and cosine take in uh, an angle in radians, and they give out a number between zero and one. So we may have something that works here. And I hope that kind of illustrated my process. Y'all, I'm dead serious. I don't remember how to do that stuff. I, I showed you my actual process. If I was coding, I am not lying to you. If I was coding and I actually had to do trigonometric functions, which I never use, I would totally Google how to take the sign in Python and open that exact page. And I mean, I would probably be quicker about it, but I would, I would copy and paste that, okay? It's not like a joke. It's not anything else. Let me show you something else that we can do, all right? Check this out. What if I wanted to print out this math? And then I'm going to hit the dot button. And look at all the stuff that comes out. Do y'all see this? I can take the arc sign, the arc cosine. That one. <laughs> the arc tangent, right? I can do all of this stuff, right? I can calculate the distance between two points. I can take an exponent. I could get the factorial of something. I don't even know. The greatest common denominator of two numbers. The hypotenuse, I guess. Check out all that stuff that we can do. We can go from radians to degrees and degrees to radians. We can, we can take a square root of a number. How did you get that to pop up? 
that it's not popping up on mine. Oh, it isn't. So I just yeah. did math and then dot, and it it opened up for me. Are you oh. on Chrome or? Um, no, I'm on Edge. Oh, that might be it. Okay. Sometimes Microsoft browsers, in order to be more secure, limit functionality, and so it really may be just a setting in there that they just. Oh yeah. So, okay, well, I'm just gonna Chrome. Thank awesome. You. So if so if I you know if I click square root. I open it up. It'll tell me that I need like a number in there. So I'm going to take the square root of, I don't even know if this number is, is, is got a square root, but nine, eight, wait, well, how can I do it? Eight, six, seven, five, three, or nine. All right, there we go. We're going to see what that, that can give us. It says we probably need to make it an int. Maybe. Is that what it's doing? Print. What in the world? Do I have too many? Oh, I don't have enough curly braces. I mean, uh, parentheses. I'm sorry. Let me take this out. That's all that I had. All right. The square root of 8675309 is 2945.3877504, whatever, right? So look at what functions gets us. It gets us a lot of stuff. How do y'all feel about that? Y'all feel okay? Iffy? Awesome. So I'm going to show you the assignment that I teased about two stinking weeks ago that I'm so happy that we're going to start. I asked you to pick your biggest fandom, all right? And we, we had some Bridgerton nonsense going on. And despite that, I didn't immediately quit. All right. Uh, we have, nope, 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 not that. We have this. Where is it? I swear it was right up here. Python final project, right at the top. Nope, nope. How do I get to uh, y'all? Computers are horrible. They suck. Why would anybody want to go into computer science? All right, well, I'm just going to have to do it like this. All right. Uh, is there a way to do instructions? There we go. All right, computers. All right, uh, here's what I want you to do. Okay, first things first. It really is called part zero here. I need you to understand about computer science that what I'm asking you to build is probably going to take a few hours, maybe a few days. Okay. But here's the thing about it. We go in baby steps. Earlier, I called it program decomposition, taking the bigger problems and splitting up into smaller problems for your final project. I've sort of highlighted some baby steps that you can take, all right? And I want you to take those baby steps. Part zero requires no code, okay? It requires pen and paper. And I do want you to literally write this on pen and paper. We are way too quick to not write on pen and paper, okay? We like to get, get on our keyboards and that's it. So seriously, I want you to get on a pen and paper. And I want you to write out a couple of things. First, you need a protagonist, the character that's going to be the user's character. All right. They should have a name, a backstory, and three different attacks. As an example, the hero of the Star Wars original trilogy, Darth Vader, right? We take Darth Vader as our protagonist, right? And they have a big backstory behind Darth Vader. They made a needless three prequels to describe that backstory. All right. You know, I'm sorry. The geek stuff is just going to come. I mean, it's just, it's all right. So there's this big backstory, but you can put a couple of paragraphs worth of backstory. And then you think of three attacks that Darth Vader would use, like hitting with a lightsaber, force choking somebody. All right. 
And then, what was the other one? Oh, shooting with a blaster. All right, I was really lazy when I wrote that because I don't think Vader ever used a blaster. But okay, anyway. All right, so let's take somebody's um, protagonist. Did anybody have a protagonist that they were thinking of for this assignment? Like a particular nerddom? Pokemon. Pokemon. All right, so perfect. So Carter chooses Pikachu, all right? And Pikachu has a couple of different attacks. That's an electric type Pokemon. They can do shock, bolt, or electric storm, right? So these three. Now, I knew shock was one, bolt maybe one, electric storm was me struggling, all right? I knew he was an electric type. I get partial credit, all right? So absolutely. So we have that little bit of backstory, and those are the three. Now, it's going to be a little bit harder if you choose something that's not more of like an attack style game, but by all means, try to make it work. The second part is I want you to have an antagonist, someone that you're fighting against, and three attacks, just like the protagonist had. So in the case of Star Wars, the antagonist would be Luke Skywalker, right? And his attacks would be whine a lot and take too long to develop the story and, you know, that sort of thing, right? So you've got each one of those sections for protagonist and antagonist. Note at this point, you have no code, all right? Um, second, part one, the first thing that we start to code out, all right, is I'm going to do this a little bit in front of you, okay? I'm going to do it. Uh, where, 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 where? Here. Look, if I were starting this, this is what I would do. I'd sit there and go, John Burris, final Python assignment like this. And it is a Harry Potter game. Yay. All right, that kind of stuff. So I would put my comments at the top. But then we go back to the assignment, and it says part one. The program you sh create should print out the introduction to your game. It will be in paragraph form and be the story behind your text-based adventure game. It should, at a minimum, explain your characters and the backstory for the protagonist. It should then describe the battle that is about to take place. So I'm going to show you what this will actually look like in code, okay? Inside of code, don't overcomplicate it. We're printing out to the screen. <laughs> all right all i'm doing is printing these out line by line that's all i'm that's all i'm doing when i hit run i'm going to check and see how far i've gone i've already messed up oh, I, a period oh yeah right there did somebody catch that? Jennifer, did you catch that? I caught it. Oh, Elena, good job. Good job. All right. So we're, we're already starting to solve it. Look how easy part one is. Part one is nothing but a whole bunch of print statements. That's all it is, is a whole bunch of print statements. So y'all have got that, right? Totally easy. It's decomposing the program for each one. So the next step. It says select your difficulty. Look at this one. It's um, the next, uh, after introducing the game, the character should allow the user to select a level of difficulty. Each character will have a variable that holds the health of the character. If the user selects the easiest level, the protagonist will have 75 and the antagonist will have 40. If the user selects a medium, it's 50 and 50. Or if it's hard, it's 50-75. But y'all, look at what it said. It said the user should be able to select a difficulty. Remember that input thing that we had? And then there was a prompt that said, enter your difficulty. Remember that? And that goes into a variable or something? Like this? And it says if they entered in,
and we set the variables to something. Remember that stuff? We can totally do this. Sorry, I didn't use snake case. When we break it down piece by piece and try to get the code to solve it, we can do this. All right, we absolutely can do this. And this is enough code to cover everything in that assignment. You actually have enough background components to get each one done. So the first one, it says pick your, pick your difficulty, and it changes the health. The next thing on the project is it asks for what is your attack? So pick attack one, two, or three. And there's some sample output here for you. And I'm going to work on formatting this. But this is all it is. Look, uh, it was a dark and dreary night when we join our hero, Mac Bolin, as he enters an opening to a dark, dark cave. As primeval PI, he couldn't be too picky about his cases which is too bad since he would love to be anywhere but here. The cave is pitch black. Within moments, Max seemed to have forgotten what it looked like to see light. The darkness made the next moments even more terrifying as a flash of light revealed a horrible sight. There stood down under, chief of the dinosaur tra tribe that had been plaguing Max village. Y'all, I'm sorry about this. I let my first computer science class I ever teach do the example for the program. And how they chose the dino trap with down under is just, I don't even remember. It was like eight years ago. It's not a good story. But then it goes, okay, so choose your level. Easy, challenge, or hard. They chose challenge. So that gave 50 and 50. The next step was it says choose your attack. One, bull rush that dino. Two, put a bullet in him. Three, roast his tail with a fireball. Y'all, I had to edit that. Y'all can imagine what my students wanted to roast on that one. So, And then you picked one, and it goes, okay, you bullwashed him and got him good. And you can see the decrease in Down Under's health of five. Then Down Under bit you, it hurt, and then it goes down 10 for Mac Bolin. All right, so you've got two more challenges with this that are going to go into it. And for some reason, one is not showing up in the assignment. All right. You're going to have a while loop that keeps going until somebody dies. All right. You're going to have to figure that part out. And the last one is, is you're going to have to add an element of chance to the game. And the element of chance is going to be this. Your attacks should have different degrees of accuracy. So, like, imagine you're doing Harry Potter, right? And, and his go-to spell is Expelliarmos. And it's like the disarming the, uh, charm, right? And he's, it's like the one he's known for. But it doesn't hurt him, right? So it does like one damage, but it's like it hits every time. But then you've got this really awesome spell like Avada Kedavra that does like a billion points of damage. But it's like not as accurate. You only have like a 1% chance of hitting him, right? So that's what makes the game fun. Now... I don't know if a single person in this room has ever played Dungeons and Dragons before. Has anybody played Dungeons and Dragons? Jennifer, you're like my big hope on this one. Have you ever played D&D? I was never invited to those parties. <laughs> oh, all right. So I'm going to give you a hint. And the hint is Dungeons and Dragons. In Dungeons and Dragons, they do this all the time. If you go up in front of like this huge monster and you're going to fight this huge monster, have y'all ever heard like the phrase roll for initiative or roll for this? And then they tell you the number of the dice that you have to get to do that, right? And so there's something called a D20. And a D20 is a 20-sided dice. Let me show you what this looks like. So it looks like this. It's uh, and there's like a phrase for like Dika, Deka, Hojokan or something like that. That's the a twenty sided dice, and you roll it. And what they say is, okay, you win if you get a seventeen or higher on a d twenty. So you go roll, and it got me a nine. I lost. Got me a fourteen. I lost. Five. I lost. Nine. I lost. One. I lost. Sixteen. I lost. Seventeen. 
I haven't. Oh, I saw a 19 in there. I won a single time. All right. But let's think of it this way. If I had a 10 sided dice, right? I rolled a four, a one, a five, a nine, a 10, an eight, a 10, a five. All right. So let me ask you this. If I had a 10 sided dice and I wanted somebody to roll so that they win 60% of the time, no, let's do it easier. They have a they have a 10 sided dice and they roll it and I want them to win half the time. How could we say, okay, we want you to run half of the time on a D10? If they roll a blank or higher. Five or higher. Five or higher. Absolutely. Now, what if you wanted them to only win like one time out of every 10? You have to get a 10. You have to get a 10, all right? So that's my hint to you, okay? So imagine this. If you wanted to get to where your attack, so let's uh, let's use Katie's Bridgerton, okay? So Katie has one, and it's like, be charming or something. And it's like, it's the big one, right? And, and it only has a very small percentage of getting it. Imagine if I did a random number generator between one and five and if it pulled back a one it hit if it pulled anything else it missed does that make sense so if i wanted something to hit 90 percent of the time i could do a random number generator between one and ten and if the number is nine or less it hits does that make sense Y'all are in D&D now. Y'all are in the club. Y'all are in the club. Y'all start building out your profiles, and we'll have a little table meet. On, I know y'all are free Mondays at 7. Like, now it's Google Meet D&D. I mean, that's what we're going to do, okay? Um, so I want you to try to solve this. Now, here's the thing about it, okay? Connect with me on this one. The challenge I've given you with this, with this game is tough. It's going to take some effort and it's going to take some looking. Things are going to go wrong. But y'all are going to email me or text me, right? When y'all get a problem that you can't solve and we're going to work through this. And this is going to be your crowning achievement. And I need you to know something. If you can solve this, you can solve anything in computer science. <clears throat> Every mechanism of code is represented in this assignment. Everything. It is. And I'm, I'm telling you, I know the theory behind it. I can do a mathematical proof if you have the next seven hours free. All right. You've got everything that you need to do with this piece of code. So, so really focus and try hard on it and reach out to me if you have any issues. Okay. Any questions for me? We are meeting next Monday at seven, but we're just showing off games or we're getting help. But I hope a lot of people want to show off their game. All right. So Carter's doing Pokemon. Anybody else want to share their uh, nerddom of choice? I'm doing Ben 10, if you know what that is. Oh, yeah. Got the uh, little watch. Pick which uh, alien you are. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I know that would probably be offensive to a Ben 10 fan because I know that has a name. I just don't know what the name of it is. So uh, anybody else got a, got a, a, a fandom? No. I, I have one more question. Um, whenever in, whenever we're importing methods, um, can we import um, like all the methods we want at the top and then they'll go for the whole program? List them yeah. down. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Yeah, your intuition was spot on with that, Zach. Absolutely. Oh, Jennifer, if that was your kid's art, you have to share it. Close okay. Hang on. Eyes. He's telling me I have to close my eyes to see it. Okay. Can, can we them? see it too? Can, can I want to see, see it? it? After you close your eyes, well, you all got to close your eyes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you going to hold it up? You got to hold it up here. Close okay. Mine are closed. All right. Mine are closed. Hurry up. Hold it up. Let's, I'm gonna put a light on it. Oh. You gotta tell them what it is. Oh, but it's wonderful. You gotta speak loud. 
Skull crawler. Skull crawler. Godzilla. With so much detail. That's awesome, buddy. Godzilla versus King Kong. All of them are in there. Godzilla's, Godzilla versus King Kong and Skull crawler. Awesome. Yeah. I don't know who wins between Godzilla and King Kong. Who wins? Is it Godzilla or King Kong? Who, who wins, Reese? King Kong. Godzilla wins. Godzilla, Godzilla wins. Godzilla wins. All right. Very good. Godzilla, King Kong, Skull Crawler, Mecha Godzilla, and Mecha Godzilla. Warbat. Warbat. Two. Warbat. Awesome. <laughs> and Skull Crawler. Okay. Hudson, have you seen those? He hasn't seen Godzilla? Thank you. Thank you. Also, he can't thank hear you. <laughs> thank you. All right. So, <laughs> awesome. So, y'all, I'm going to, we'll, we'll call it for today. I ended up keeping y'all the whole time. Uh, I didn't think I had the energy to go the entire day today. But uh, uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll meet up next Monday. Work on this game. It's fun. I promise. Even if you hate it, it's fun. And uh and, and we'll get to the uh next Monday to show it off. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye, good night.